Essay 6 of Conduct of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Conduct of Life by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Worship. This is he who, felled by foes, sprung harmless up, refreshed by blows. He to captivity was sold, but him no prison bars would hold though they sealed him in a rock mountain chains he can unlock thrown to lions for their meat the crouching lions kissed his feet bound to the stake no flames appalled but arched o'er him an honouring vault this is he men miscall fate threading dark ways arriving late but ever coming in time to crown the truth and hurl wrongdoers down he is the oldest the best known more near than aught thou callest thy own yet greeted in another's eyes, disconcerts with glad surprise. This is Jove, who, deaf to prayers, floods with blessings unawares. Draw, if thou canst, the mystic line, severing rightly his from thine, which is human, which divine. Worship Some of my friends have complained, when the preceding papers were read, that we discussed fate, power and wealth on too low a platform gave too much line to the evil spirits of the times too many cakes to cerberus and we ran cudworth's worth of making by excessive candour the argument of atheism so strong that he could not answer it i have no fear of being forced in my own despite to play as we say the devil's attorney i have no infirmity of faith no belief that it is of much importance what i or any man say i am sure that a certain truth will be said through me though I should be dumb, or though I should try to say the reverse, nor do I fear skepticism for any good soul. A just thinker will allow full swing to a skepticism. I dip my pen in the blackest ink, because I am not afraid of falling into my ink-pot. I have no sympathy with a man who I knew, who, when suicides abounded, told me he dared not look at his razor. We are different of opinions at different hours, but we always may be said to be at heart on the side of truth." I see not why we should give ourselves such sanctified airs. If the divine providence has hid from men neither disease, nor deformity, nor corrupt society, but has stated itself out in passions, in war and trade, in the love of power and pleasure, in hunger and need, in tyrannies, literatures, and arts, let us not be so nice, that we cannot write these facts down coarsely as they stand, or doubt but where there is a counterstatement as ponderous, which we can arrive at, and which, being put, will make all square. The solar system has no anxiety about its reputation, and the credit of truth and honesty is as safe, nor have I any fear that a skeptical bias can be given by leaning hard on the side of fate, of practical power, or of trade, which the doctrine of faith cannot downweigh. The strength of that principle is not measured in ounces and pounds, it tyrannizes at the center of nature. We may well give skepticism as much line as we can, the spirit will return, and fill us. It drives the drivers. It counterbalances any accumulations of power. Heaven kindly gave our blood a moral flow. We are born loyal. The whole creation is made of hooks and eyes, of bitumen, of sticking plaster. And whether your community is made in Jerusalem or in California, of saints or of wreckers, it coheres in a perfect ball. Men as naturally make a state or a church as a caterpillar is a web. If they were more refined, it would be less formal. It would be nervous, like that of the Shakers, who, from long habit of thinking and feeling together, it is said, are affected in the same way, at the same time, to work and to play, as they go with perfect sympathy to their tasks in the field or shop, so they are inclined for a ride or a journey at the same instant, and the horses come up with the family carriage unbespoken to the door. We are born believing. A man bears beliefs, as a tree bears apples. A self-poise belongs to every particle an erectitude to every mind, and is the nemesis and protector of every society. I and my neighbors have been bred in the notion that, unless we come soon to some good church, Calvinism, or Behemanism, or Romanism, or Mormonism, there would be a universal thaw and dissolution. No Isaiah or Jeremiah has arrived. Nothing can exceed the anarchy that has followed in our skies. The stern old faiths have been pulverized. "'Tis a whole population of gentlemen and ladies out in search of religions. "'Tis as flat anarchy in our ecclesiastical realms as that which existed in Massachusetts in the Revolution, 
which prevails now on the slope of the Rocky Mountains or Pike's Peak. Yet we make shift to live. Men are loyal. Nature has self-poised in all her works. Certain proportions in which oxygen and azote combine, and, not less a harmony of faculties, a fitness in the spring and then in the regulator. A declining influence of Calvin, of Fenelon, of Wesley, or Channing, need give us no uneasiness. The builder of heaven has not so ill-constructed his creature as that the religion, that is, the public nature, should fall out. The public and the private element, like north and south, like inside and outside, like centrifugal and centripetal, adhere to every soul, and cannot be subdued, except the soul is dissipated. God builds his temple in the heart on the ruins of churches and religions. In the last chapters, we treated some particulars of the question of culture. But the whole state of man is a state of culture, and its flowering and completion may be described as religion, or worship. There is always some religion, some hope and fear extended into the invisible. From the blind boating which nails a horseshoe to the mast or the threshold, up to the song of the elders of the apocalypse. But the religion cannot rise above the state of the votary. Heaven always bears some proportion to earth. The god of the cannibals will be a cannibal, of the crusaders a crusader, of the merchants a merchant, in all ages, souls out of time, extraordinary, prophetic, are born, who are rather related to the system of the world than to their particular age and locality. These announce absolute truths, which, with whatever reverence received, are speedily dragged down into a savage interpretation. The interior tribes of our Indians, and some of the Pacific Islanders, flog their gods, when things take an unfortunate turn. The Greek poets did not hesitate to let loose their petulant wists on the deities also. Laomedon, in his anger at Neptune and Apollo, who had built Troy for him, and demanded their price, does not hesitate to menace them that he will cut off their ears. Among our Norse forefathers, King Olaf's mode of converting Ivan to Christianity was to put a pan of glowing coals on his belly, which burst asunder. Wilt thou now, Ivan, believe in Christ, asked Olaf, in excellent faith? Another argument was an adder put into the mouth of the reluctant disciple Rand, who refused to believe. Christianity in the Romantic Ages signifies European culture, the grafted or meliorated tree in a crab forest and to marry a pagan wife or husband was to marry a beast, and voluntary to take a step backwards towards the baboon. Hengus had Veramant, a daughter both fair and gent, but she was heathen Sarazine, and Terragorn for love fine, her took to fear and to wife, and was cursed in all his life, for he let Christian wed heathen, and mixed our blood as flesh and maiden. What Gothic mixtures the Christian creed drew from the pagan sources, Richard of Devise's chronicle of Richard I's crusade in the 12th century may show King Richard taunts God with forsaking him. Oh, fie, how unwilling should I be to forsake thee in so forlorn and dreadful a position, were I thy lord and advocate, as thou art mine. In sooth, my standards will in future be despised, not through my fault, but through thine. In sooth, not through my cowardice and my warfare, art thou my thyself, my king and my God conquered this day, and not Richard thy vassal. The religion of the early English is anomalous, so devout and so blasphemous in the same breath. Such is Chaucer's extraordinary confusion of heaven and earth in the picture of Dido. She was so fair, so young, so lusty, and her eyes glad, that if that god that heaven and earth made would have a love for beauty and goodness and womanhood, truth and seemliness, whom should he love in but this lady sweet, wherein no woman to himself half so meet? With these grossnesses, we complacently compare our own taste and decorum. We think and speak with more temperance and gradation. But is not indifferentism as bad as superstition? We live in a transition period, when the old faith which comforted nations, and not only so, but made nations, seem to have spent their force. I do not find the religions of men at this moment very creditable to them, but either childish and insignificant, or unmanly and effeminating. The fatal trait is the divorce between religion and morality. Here are no-nothing religions, or churches that prescribe intellect, scordatory religions, slave-holding and slave-trading religions, and even in our decent populations, idolatries wherein the whiteness of the ritual covers scarlet indulgence. The lover of the old religion complains that our contemporaries, scholars as well as merchants, succumb to a great despair, have corrupted into a timorous conservatism and believe in nothing. In our large cities, the population is godless, materialized. No bond, no fellow feeling, no enthusiasm. These are not men, but hungers, thirsts, fevers, and appetites walking. 
How is it people manage to live on, so aimless as they are? After their peppercorn aims are gained, it seems as if the lime in their bones alone held them together. Not any worthy purpose. There is no faith in the intellectual, none in the moral universe. There is faith in chemistry, in meat, in wine, in wealth, in machinery, in the steam engine, galvanic battery, turbine wheels, sewing machines, and in public opinion, but not in divine causes. A silent revolution has loosed the tensions of the old religious sects, and in place of the gravity and permanence of those societies of opinion, they run into freak and extravagance. In creeds never was such levity. Witness the heathenism in Christianity, the periodic revivals, the millennial mathematics, the peacock ritualism, the retrogression into popery, the maundering of Mormons, the squalor of mesmerism, the deliration of wrappings, the rat and mouse revelations, thumps and table drawers, the black arts, the architecture, the music, the prayer, partake of the madness. The arts sink into shifts and make-believe. Not knowing what to do, we ape our ancestors. The churches stagger backwards the mummeries of the dark ages. But the irresistible maturing of the general mind, the Christian tradition has lost their hold. The dogma of the mystic offices of Christ being dropped, and the standing of his genius as a moral teacher, it is impossible to maintain the old emphasis of his personality, and it recedes, as all persons must, before the sublimity of the moral laws. From this change, and in the momentary absence of any religious genius that could offset the immense material activity, there is a feeling that religion is gone. When Paul Leroux offered his article, Dieu, to the conductor of the leading French journal, he replied, La question de dia manque d'actualité. In Italy, Mr. Gladstone said of the late King of Naples, it has been a proverb, that he has erected the negation of God into a system of government. In this country, the like stupefaction was in the air, and the phrase, higher law, became a political jibe. What proof of infidelity, like the toleration of propagandism of slavery? What, like the direction of education? What, the faculty of conversation? What, like the facility of conversion? What, like the externality of churches, that once sucked the roots of right and wrong, and now have perished away till they are a speck of whitewash on the wall? What proof of skepticism, like the base rate at which the highest mental and moral gifts are held? Let a man attain the highest and broadest culture that any American has possessed. Then let him die by sea storm, railroad collision, or other accident, and all America will acquiesce that the best thing has happened to him, that after the education has gone far, such is the expensiveness of America, that the best use to put a fine person is to drown him to save his board. Another scar of his skepticism is the distrust in human virtue. It is believed by well-dressed proprietors that there is no more virtue than they possess, that the solid portion of society exists for the arts of comfort, that life is an affair to put somewhat between the upper and lower mandibles. How prompt the suggestion of a low motive! Certain patriots in England devoted themselves for years to creating a public opinion that should break down the corn laws and establish free trade. Well, says the man on the street, Cobden got a stripend out of it. Kassuth fled hither across the ocean to try if he could arouse the new world to a sympathy with European liberty. Aye, said the New York. He made a handsome thing of it, enough to make him comfortable for life. See what allowance vice finds in a respectable and well-conditioned class. If a pickpocket intrude into the society of gentlemen, they exert what moral force they have, and he finds himself uncomfortable and glad to get away. But if an adventurer go through all the forms, procure himself to be elected to be post of trust, as of a senator or president, though by the same arts as we detest in the house thief, the same gentlemen who agree to discountenance in the private rogue will be forward to show civilities and marks of respect to the public one, and no amount of evidence of his crimes will prevent them from giving him ovations, complimentary dinners, opening their houses to him, and priding themselves on his acquaintance. We were not deceived by the professions of the private adventurer. The louder he talked of his honor, the faster we counted our spoons. But we appealed to the sanctified preamble of the messages and proclamations of the public sinner as a proof of sincerity. It must be that they who pay this homage have said to themselves, On the whole, we don't know about this that you call honesty. A bird in the hand is better. Even well disposed, good sort of people are touched with the same infidelity, and for brave, straightforward action, use half measures and compromises. Forgetful that a little measure is a great error, forgetful that a wise mechanic uses a sharp tool, they go on choosing the dead men of routine. But the official men can in no wise help you in any question of today, they depriving entirely from the old dead things. 
only those who can help in counsel or conduct, who do not make a party pledge to defend this or that, but who are appointed by God Almighty, before they came into the world, to stand for this which they uphold. It has been charged that a want of sincerity in leading men is a vice general throughout American society, but the multitude of the sick shall not make us deny the existence of health. In spite of our imbecility and terrors, the universal decay of religion, etc., etc., the moral sense reappears today with the same morning newness that has been from of old the fountain of beauty and strength. You say there is no religion now. It is like saying in rainy weather there is no sun, when at that moment we are witnessing one of his superlative effects. The religion of the cultivated class now, to be sure, consists in an avoidance of acts and engagements which it was once their religion to assume. But this avoidance will yield spontaneous forms in their due hour. There is a principle which is the basis of things, which all speech aims to say, and all action to evolve, a simple, quiet, undescribed, undescribable presence, dwelling very peacefully in us, our rightful Lord. We are not to do, we are to let do, not to work, but to be worked upon. And to this homage there is a consent of all thoughtful and just men in all ages and conditions. To this sentiment belong vast and sudden enlargements of power. It is remarkable that our faith in ecstasy consists with total inexperience of it. It is the order of the world to educate with accuracy the senses and the understanding, and the engineer to work to draw out these powers in propriety, no doubt, has its office. But we are never without a hint that these powers are mediate and servile, and that we are one day to deal with real being, essences with essences. Even the fury of material activity has some results, friendly to moral health. The energetic actions of the times develops individualism, and the religious appear isolated. I see this as a step in the right direction. Heaven deals with us on no representative system. Souls are not saved in bundles. The spirits say to them, How is it with thee, thee personally? Is it well? Is it ill? For great nature, it is happiness to escape a religious training. Religion of character is so apt to be invaded. Religion must always be a crab fruit. It cannot be crafted and keep its wild beauty. I have seen, said a traveler, who had known the extremes of society, I have seen human nature in all its forms. It is everywhere the same, but the wilder it is, the more virtuous. We say, the old forms of religion decay, and that a skepticism devastates the community. I do not think it can be cured or stayed by any modification of theological creeds, much less by theological discipline. The cure for false theology is mother wit. Forget your books and traditions, and obey your moral perceptions at this hour. That which is signified by the words moral and spiritual is a lasting essence, and with whatever illusions we have loaded them, will certainly bring back the words, age after age, to their ancient meaning. I know no words but that mean so much. In our definitions we grope after the spiritual by describing it as invisible. The true meaning of spiritual is real. That law which executes itself, which works without means, and which cannot be conceived of as not existing. Men talk of mere morality which is much as if one should say, Poor God, with nobody to help him. I find the omnipresence and the almightiness in the reaction of every atom in nature. I can best indicate by examples those reactions by which every part of nature replies to the purpose of the actor, beneficently to the good, penally to the bad. Let us replace sentimentalism by realism, and dare to uncover those simple and terrible laws, which, be they seen or unseen, pervade and govern. Every man takes care that his neighbor shall not cheat him. But a day comes when he begins to care that he do not cheat his neighbor. Then all goes well. He has changed his market cart into a chariot of the sun. What a day dawns when we have taken to heart the doctrine of faith, to prefer, as a better investment, being to doing, being to seeming. Logic to rhythm and to display. The year to the day. The life to the year. Character to performance. I have come to know that justice will be done us. And, if our genius is slow, the term will be long. It is certain that worship stands in some commanding relation to the health of man, and to his highest powers, so as to be in some manner the source of intellect. All the great ages have been ages of belief. I mean, when there was any extraordinary power of performance, when great national movements began, when arts appeared, when heroes existed, when poems were made, the human soul was in earnest, and had fixed its thought on spiritual verities, with as strict a grasp as that of the hands of the sword, or the pencil, or the trowel. It is true that genius takes its rise out of the mountains of rectitude, and all beauty and power which men covet are somehow born out of the alpine district, which any extraordinary degree of beauty in man or woman involves moral charm. 
Thus, I think, we very slowly admit in another man a higher degree of moral sentiment than our own, a finer conscience, more impressionable, or, which marks minuter degrees, an ear to hear acuter notes of right or wrong than we can. I think we listen suspiciously and very slowly to any evidence to that point, but once satisfied of such superiority, we set no limit on our expectations of his genius, for such persons are nearer to the secret of God than others are bathed in sweeter waters. They hear notices, they see visions, where others are vacant. We believe the holiness confers a certain insight, because, not by our private, by our public force, can we share and know the nature of things. There is an intimate interdependence of intellect and morals. Given the equality of two intellects, which will form the most reliable judgment, the good or the bad-hearted? The heart has its arguments, which the understanding is not acquainted. For the heart is at once aware of the state of health or disease, which is the controlling state, that is, of sanity or of insanity, prior, of course, to all question of the ingenuity of arguments, the amount of facts, or the elegance of rhetoric. So intimate is the alliance of mind and heart that talent uniformly sinks with character. The bias of errors of principle carries away men into perilous courses, as soon as their will does not control their passions or talent. Hence the extraordinary blunders and final wrong head into which men spoiled by ambition usually fall. Hence the remedy for all blunders, the cure of blindness, the cure of crime, is love. As much love, so much mind, said the Latin proverb, superiority that has no superior. The redeemer and instructor of the souls, as it is their primal essence, is love. The moral must be the measure of health. If your eye is on the eternal, your intellect will grow, and your opinions and your actions will have a beauty which no learning or combined advantages of other men can rival. The moment of your loss of faith, the acceptance of the lucrative standard, will be marked in the pause, or solstice of genius, the sequent retrogression, and the inevitable loss of attraction to other minds. The vulgar are sensible of the change in you, and of your descent, and they clap you on your back and congratulate you your increased common sense. Our recent culture has been in natural science. We have learned the manners of the sun and the moon, of the rivers and the rains, of the minerals and elemental kingdoms, of plants and animals. Man has learned to weigh the sun, and its weight neither loses nor gains. The path of the star, the moment of an eclipse, can be determined to the fraction of the second. While to him the book of history, the book of love, the lures of passion, and the commandments of duty are opened. And the next lesson taught is the continuation of the inflexible law of matter into the subtle kingdom of will and of thought, that, if in sidereal ages, gravity and projection keep their craft, and the ball never loses its way in its wild path through space, a secret of gravitation, a secret of projection, will not less tyrannically in human history, and keep the balance of power from age to age unbroken. For though the new element of freedom in an individual has been admitted, yet the primordial atoms are prefigured and determined by moral issues, are in search of justice, and ultimate right is done. Religion or worship is the attitude of those who see this unity, intimacy, and sincerity, who see that, against all appearances, the nature of things work for the truth and right forever. Tis a short sight to limit our faith in laws to those of gravity, of chemistry, of botany, and so forth. Those laws do not stop where our eyes lose them, but push the same geometry and chemistry up in the invisible plane of social and rational life, so that, look where we will, in a boy's game or in the strifes of races, a perfect reaction or perpetual judgment keeps watch and ward. And this appears in a class of facts which concerns all men, within and above their creeds. Shallow men believe in luck, believe in circumstances. It was somebody's name, or he happened to be there at the time, or it was so then, and another day it would have been otherwise. Strong men believe in cause and effect. The man was born to do it, and his father was born to be the father of him and of his deed, and, by looking narrowly, you shall see that there is no luck in the matter but it was all a problem in arithmetic, or an experiment in chemistry. The curve of the flight of the moth is preordained, and all things go by number, rule, and weight. Skepticism is unbelief in cause and effect. A man does not see that as he eats, so he thinks. As he deals, so he is, and so he appears. He does not see that his son is the son of his thoughts and of his actions, that fortunes are not expectations but fruits that relation and connection are not somewhere and sometimes, but everywhere and always. No miscellany, no exemption, no anomaly, but method and an even web, and that comes out what was put in. As we are, so we do, and as we do, so it is done to us. We are the builders of our fortunes. Can't and lying in the attempt to secure a good which does not belong to us are, once for all, balked in vain. 
but in the human mind this tie of fate is made alive. The law is the basis of the human mind. In us it is inspiration. Out there in nature we see its fatal strength. We call it the moral sentiment. We owe to the Hindu scriptures a definition of law, which compares well with any of our Western books. Law it is which is without name, or color, or hands, or feet, which is smallest of the least, and largest of the large. All, and knowing all things, which hears without ears, sees without eyes, moves without feet, and seizes without hands. If any reader tax me with using vague and traditional phrases, let me suggest to him, by a few examples, what kind of trust this is, and how real. Let me show him that the dice are loaded, that the colors are fast, because they are the native colors of the fleece, that the globe is a battery, because every atom is a magnet, that the fleece and sincerity of the universe are secured by God's delegating his divinity to every particle. There is no room for hypocrisy, no margin for choice. The countryman leaving his native village for the first time and going abroad finds all his habits broken up. In a few nations and languages his sect, as Quaker, as Lutheran, is lost. What? Is not that necessary to the order of existence of society? He misses this and the commanding eye of his neighborhood, which held him to decorum. This is the peril of New York, of New Orleans, of London, of Paris, to young men. But after a little experience he makes the discovery that there are no large cities, none large enough to hide in that the censors of action are as numerous and as near as Paris, as in Littleton or Portland, that the gossip is as prompt and vengeful, there is no concealment, and for each offense a several vengeance, that reaction, or nothing for nothing, or things are as broad as they are long, is the rule for Littleton as Portland, but for the universe. We cannot spare the coarsest muniment of virtue. We are disgusted by gossip, yet it is of importance to keep the angels in the proprieties. The smallest fly will draw blood." and gossip is a weapon impossible to exclude from the privatest, highest, selectest. Nature created a police of many ranks. God was delegated himself to a million deputies. From these low external penalties the scale ascends. Next comes the resentments, the fears which injustice calls out, then the false relations in which the offender is put to other men, and the reaction of his faults on himself in the solitude and devastation of his mind. You cannot hide any secret. If the artist Sakura is flagging spirits with opium or wine, his work will characterize itself as the effect of opium or wine. If you make a picture or a statue, it sets the beholder in the state of mind you had when you made it. If you spend for show on building or gardening or pictures or on equipages, so it will appear. We are all physiognomists and penetrators of character, and things themselves are detective. If you follow the suburban fashion in building a sumptuous-looking house for a little money, it will appear to all eyes as a cheap dear house. There is no privacy that cannot be penetrated. No secret can be kept in the civilized world. Society is a masked ball, where everyone hides his real character and reveals it by hiding. If a man wish to conceal anything he carries, those whom he meets know that he conceals somewhat, and usually know what he conceals. Is it otherwise if there be some belief or some purpose he would bury in his breast? Tis as hard to hide as fire. He is a strong man who can hold down his opinion. A man cannot utter two or three sentences without disclosing to intelligent ears precisely where he stands in life and thought, namely, whether in the kingdom of the senses and the understanding, or in that of ideas and imagination, the realm of intuitions and duty. People seem not to see that their opinions of the world is also a confession of character. We can only see what we are, and if we misbehave, we suspect others. The fame of Shakespeare, or of Voltaire, or of Thomas a Kempis, or Bonaparte, characterizes those who give it. As gaslight is found to be the best nocturnal police, so the universe protects itself by pitiless publicity. Each must be armed, not necessarily with musket or pike. Happy, if seeing these, he can feel that he has better muskets and pikes in his energy and constancy. To every creature is his own weapon, however skillfully concealed from himself a good while. His work is sword and shield. Let him accuse none. Let him injure none. The way to mend the bad world is to create the right world. Here is a low political economy plotting to cut the throat of foreign competition and establish our own, excluding others by force or making war on them, or by cunning tariffs, giving the preferences to the worst wares of ours. But the real and lasting victories are those of peace and not of war. The way to conquer the foreign artisan is not to kill him, but to beat his work and the crystal palaces and world fairs, with their committees and prizes and all kinds of industry, are the results of this feeling. The American workman who strikes ten blows with his hammer, whilst the foreign workman only strikes one, 
is as really vanquishing that foreigner as if the blows were aimed at and told on his person. I look on that man as happy who, when there is a question of success, looks into his work for reply, and not into the market, not into opinion, not into patronage. In every variety of human employment, in the mechanical and the fine arts, in navigation, in farming and legislating, there is among the numbers who do their tasks perfunctorily, as we say, or just to pass, as badly as they dare. There are the working men on whom the burden of the business falls, those who love work, and love to see it rightly done, who finish their task for its own sake, and the state in the world is happy that has the most of such finishers. The world will always do justice at last to such finishers. It cannot otherwise. He who has acquired the ability may wait securely the occasion of making it felt and appreciated, and know that it will not loiter. Men talk as if victory were something fortunate. Work is victory. Wherever work is done, victory is obtained. There is no chance and no blanks. You want but one verdict. If you have your own, you are secure of the rest. And yet, if witnesses are wanted, witnesses are near. There was never a man born so wise or good, but one or more companions came to the world with him, who delight in his faculty, and report it. I cannot see without awe that no man thinks alone, that no man acts alone, but the divine assessors who came up with him into life, now under one disguise, now under another, like the police and citizens' clothes, walk with him, step for step, through all the kingdom of time. His reaction, this sincerity, is the property of all things. To make our word or act sublime, we must make it real. It is our system that counts, not a single word or unsupported action. Use what language you will. You can never say anything but what you are. What I am, and what I think, is conveyed to you, in spite of my efforts to hold it back. What I am has been secretly conveyed from me to another, whilst I was vainly making up my mind to tell him it. He has heard from me what I never spoke. As men get on in life, they acquire a love for sincerity, and somewhat less solicitude to be lulled or amused. In the progress of the character, there is an increasing faith in the moral sentiment, and a decreasing faith in propositions. Young people admire talents and particular excellences. As we grow older, we value total powers and effects as a spirit or quality of the man. We have another sight and a new standard, an insight which disregards what is done for the eye and pierces to the doer, an ear which hears not for what men say, but hears what they do not say. There was a wise, devout man who was called, in the Catholic Church, St. Philip Neri, of whom many anecdotes touching his discernment and benevolence are told at Naples and Rome. Among the nuns in a convent not far from Rome, one had appeared, who laid claim to certain rare gifts of inspiration and prophecy, and the abbess advised the Holy Father, at Rome, of the wonderful power shown by her novice. The Pope did not well know what to make of these new claims, and Philip, coming in from a journey, one day, he consulted him. Philip undertook to visit the distant convent. He told the abbess the wishes of the holiness, and begged her to summon the nun without delay. The nun was sent for, and as soon as she came into the apartment, Philip stretched out his leg, all besatted with mud, and desired her to draw off his boots. The young nun, who had become the object of much attention and respect, drew back with anger, and refused the office. Philip ran out the door, mounted his mule, and returned instantly to the Pope. Give yourself no uneasiness, Holy Father, any longer. Here is no miracle, for there is no humility. We need not much mind what people have to say, but what they must say. What their natures say, though their busy, artful Yankee understanding tried to hold back and choke that word, and to articulate something different. If we will sit quietly, what they ought to say is said, with their will or against their will. We do not care for you. Let us pretend that what we will. We are always looking through you to the dim dictator behind you. Whilst your habit or whim chatters, we civilly and patiently wait until the wise superior shall speak again. Even children are not deceived by the false reasons which their parents give in answer to their questions, whether touching natural facts or religion or persons. When the parent, instead of thinking how it really is, puts them off with a traditional or hypocritical answer, the children perceive that it is a traditional or hypocritical answer. To a sound constitution, the defect of another is at once manifest, and the marks of it are only concealed from us by our own dislocation. An anatomical observer remarks, with the sympathies of the chest, abdomen, pelvis, tell at least on the face, and on all its features. Not only does our beauty waste, but it leaves word how it went to waste. Physiognomy and phrenology are not new sciences, but declarations of the soul that is aware of certain new sources of information. And now sciences of broader scope are starting up behind these. 
and so for ourselves it is really of little importance what blunders and statement we make, so only we make no woeful departures from the truth. How a man's truth comes to mind long after we have forgotten all his words, how it comes to us in silent hours that truth is our only armor in all passages of life and death. Wit is cheap, and anger is cheap. But if you cannot argue or explain yourself to the other party, cleave to the truth against me, against thee, and you gain a station from which you cannot be dislodged. The other party will forget the words that you spoke, but the part you took continues to plead for you. Why should I hasten to solve every riddle which life offers me? I am well assured that the questioner, who brings me so many problems, will bring the answers also in due time. Very rich, very potent, very cheerful giver that he is, he shall have it all his own way, for me. Why should I give up my thought, because I cannot answer an objection to it? Consider only whether it remains in my life the same it was. That only which we have within can we see without. If we meet no gods, it is because we harbor none. If there is grandeur in you, you will find grandeur in porters and sweeps. He only is rightly immortal, to whom all things are immortal. I have read somewhere that none is accomplished, so long as any are incomplete, that the happiness of one cannot consist with the misery of any other. The Buddhists say, no seed will die. Every seed will grow. Where is the service which can escape its remuneration? What is vulgar, and the essence of all vulgarity, but the avarice of reward? Tis the difference of artisan and artist, of talent and genius, of sinner and saint. The man whose eyes are nailed not on the nature of his act, but on the wages, whether it be money or office or fame, is almost equally low. He is great, whose eyes are open to see that the reward of action cannot be escaped, because he is transformed into his action, and taketh his nature, which bears its own fruit like every other tree. A great man cannot be hindered from the effort of his act, because it is immediate. The genius of life is friendly to the noble, and the dark brings them friends from afar. Fear God, and where you go, men shall think they walk in hallowed cathedrals. And so I look on those sentiments which make the glory of the human being, love, humility, faith, as being also the intimacy of divinity in the atoms, and that as soon as the man is right, assurances and provisions emanate from the interior of his body and his mind, as when flowers reach the ripeness, incense exhales from them, and, as a beautiful atmosphere is generated from the planet by the average emanation from all its rocks and soils. Thus man is made equal to every event. He can face danger if for the right. A poor, tender, painful body, he can run into flame or bullets or pestilence with duty for his guide. He feels the insurance of a just employment. I am not afraid of accident, as long as I am in my place. It is strange that superior persons should not feel that they have some better resistance in cholera than avoiding green peas and salads. Life is hardly respectable, is it? If it has no generous, guaranteeing tasks, no duties or affections, that constitute a necessity of existing. Every man's task is his life preserver. The conviction that his work is dear to God and cannot be spared defends him. The lightning rod that disarms the cloud of its threat is his body and his duty. The high aim reacts on the means, on the days, on the organs of the body. A high aim is curative, as well as arnica. Napoleon, says Goethe, visited those sick of the plague in order to prove that the man who could vanquish fear could vanquish the plague also. And he was right. Tis incredible what force the will has in such cases. It penetrates the body. It puts it in a state of activity, which repels all hurtful influences, whilst fear invites them. It is related of William of Orange that, whilst he was besieging a town on the continent, a gentleman sent to him, and a public business came to the camp, and learning that the king was before the walls, ventured to go where he was. He found him directing the operations of his gunners, and, having explained his errand, and received his answer, the king said, Do you not know, sir, that every moment you spend here is at the risk of your life? I run no more risk, replied the gentleman, than your majesty. Yes, said the king, but my duty brings me here, and yours does not. In a few minutes the cannonball fell on the spot, and the gentleman was killed. Thus can the faithful student reverse all the warnings of his early instinct, under the guidance of a deeper instinct. He learns to welcome misfortune, learns that adversity is the prosperity of the great. He learns the greatness of humility. He shall work in the dark, work against failure, pain, and ill will. If he is insulted, he can be insulted. All his affair is not to insult. Hafiz writes, At the last day men shall wear on their heads the dust as ensign and as ornament of their lowly trust.
The moral equalizes all, enriches and powers all. It is the coin which buys all, and which all find in their pocket. Under the whip of the driver, the slave shall feel his equality with saints and heroes. In the greatest destitution and calamity, it surprises man with a feeling of elasticity which makes nothing of loss. I recall some traits of a remarkable person whose life and discourse betrayed many inspirations of his sentiment. Benedict was always great in the present time. He had hoarded nothing from the past, neither in his cabinets, neither in his memory. He had no designs on the future, neither for what he should do to men, nor for what men should do for him. He said, I am never beaten until I know I am beaten. I meet powerful, brutal people to whom I have no skill to reply. They think they have defeated me. It is so published in society in the journals. I am defeated in this fashion, in all men's sight, perhaps a dozen different lines. My leisure shows that I am in debt, cannot yet make my ends meet, and vanquish the enemy so. My race may not be prospering. We are sick, ugly, obscure, and popular. My children may be worsted. I seem to fail, and my friends and clients too. That is to say, in all the encounters that have yet to chance. I have not been weaponed for that particular occasion and have been historically beaten, and yet I know all the time that I have never been beaten, have never yet fought, shall certainly fight when my hour comes, and shall beat. A man, says the Vishnu Sarma, who having well compared his own strength or weakness with that of others, after all doth not know the difference, is easily overcome by his enemies. I spent, he said, ten months in the country, Thick-starred Orion was my only companion. Wherever a squirrel or a bee can go with security, I can go. I ate whatever was set before me. I touched ivy and dogwood. When I went abroad, I kept company with every man on the road, for I knew that my evil and my good did not come from these, but from the spirit whose servant I was. For I could not stoop to be a circumstance, as they did, who put their life into the fortune and their company. I would not degrade myself by casting about in my memory for a thought, nor by waiting for one. If the thought came, I will give it entertainment. It should, as it ought, go into my hands and feet. But if it came not spontaneously, it comes not rightly at all. If it can spare me, I am sure I can spare it. It shall be the same with my friends. I never woo the loveliest. I will not ask my friendship or favor. When I come to my own, we shall both be known. Nothing will be asked or to be granted. Benedict went out to seek his friend and met him on the way, but he expressed no surprise at any coincidences. On the other hand, if he called at the door of his friend, and he was not at home, he did not go again, concluding that he had misinterpreted the intimations. He had the whim not to make an apology to the same individual whom he had wronged, for this, he said, was a piece of personal vanity. But he would correct his conduct in that respect in which he had faulted to the next person he should meet. Thus, he said, universal justice was satisfied. Myra came to ask what she should do with the poor Genesee woman who had hired herself to work for her, at a shilling a day, and now sickening, was like to be bedridden on her hands. Should she keep her, or should she dismiss her? But Benedict said, Why ask? One thing will clear itself as a thing to be done, and not another, when the hour comes. Is it a question whether to put her into the street? Just as much whether to thrust the little Jenny in your arms into the street. The milk and meal you give to the beggar will fatten Jenny. Thrust the woman out, and you thrust your babe out of doors, whether it so seem to you or not. In the Shakers, so called, I find one piece of belief in the doctrine in which they faithfully hold that encourages them to open their doors to every wayfaring man who proposes to come among them. For, they say, the spirit will presently manifest to the man himself and to the society what manner of person he is and whether he belongs among them. They do not receive him, they do not reject him, and not in vain have they worn their clay coat, and drudged in the fields, and shuffled in their Bruin dance from year to year, if they have truly learned this much wisdom. Honor him whose life is perpetual victory, him who, by sympathy with the invisible and real, finds support in labor instead of praise, who does not shine and would rather not. His eyes open, he makes the choice of virtue, which outrages the virtuous of religion, which churches stop their discords to burn and exterminate, for the highest virtue is always against the law. Miracle comes to the miraculous, not to the arithmetician. Talent and success interest me but moderately. The great class, they who affect our imagination, the men who could not make their hands meet around their object, the rapt, the lost, the fools of ideas, they suggest what they cannot execute. 
They speak to the ages, and are heard from afar. The spirit does not love cripples and malformations. If there ever was a good man, be certain there was another, and will be more. And so in relation to the future hour, that specter clothed with beauty at our curtain by night, at our table by day, the apprehension, the assurance of a coming change. The race of mankind have always offered at least these implied thanks for the gifts of existence, namely, the terror of its being taken away, the insatiable curiosity and appetite for its continuation. The whole revelation which is vouchsafed us is the gentle trust which in our experience we find will cover over with flowers and slopes of this chasm. Of immortality, the soul, when well employed, is incurious. It is so well that it is sure it will be well. It asks no questions of the supreme power. The son of Antiochus asked his father when he should join battle. Dost thou fear, replied the king, that thou only in all the army will not hear the trumpet? Tis a higher thing to confide that, if it is best we should live, we shall live. Tis higher to have this conviction than to have the lease of indefinite centuries and millenniums and eons. Higher than the question of our duration is the question of our deserving. Immortality will come to such as are fit for it, and he who would be a great soul in future must be a great soul now. It is a doctrine too great to rest on any legend, that is, on any man's experience but our own. It must be proved, if at all, from our own activity and designs, which imply an interminable future for their play. What is called religion effeminates and demoralizes. Such as you are, the gods themselves could not help you. Men are too often unfit to live, from the obvious inequality to their own necessities, or they suffer from politics, or bad neighbors, or from sickness. They would gladly know that they were to be dismissed from the duties of life. But the wise instinct asks, how will death help them? These are not dismissed when they die. You shall not wish for death out of pusillanimity. The weight of the universe is pressed down on the shoulders of each moral agent to hold him to his task. The only path of escape known in all the world of God is performance. You must do your work before you shall be released. And as far as the question of fact respecting the government of the universe, Marcus Antoninus summed the whole in a word. It is pleasant to die if there be gods, and sad to live if there be none. So I think that the last lesson of life, the choral song which rises from the elements of all angels, is a voluntary obedience, a necessitated freedom. Man is made of the same atoms as the world. He shares the same impressions, dispositions, and destiny. When his mind is illuminated, when the heart is kind, he throws himself joyfully into the sublime order, and does with knowledge what the stones do by structure. The religion which is to guide and fulfill the present and coming ages whatever else it be, must be intellectual. The scientific mind must have a faith which is science. There are two things, said Muhammad, which I abhor, the learned in his infidelities and the fool in his devotions. Our times are impatient of both, and especially the last. Let us have nothing now which is not its own evidence. There is surely enough for the heart and imagination in the religion itself. Let us not be pestered with assertions and half-truths, with emotions and snuffle. There will be a new church, founded on moral science, at first cold and naked, a babe in a manger again, the algebra and mathematics of ethical law, the church of men to come, without shams or psaltery or sackbut. But it will have heaven and earth for its beams and rafters science for symbol and illustration it will fast enough gather beauty music picture poetry was never stoicism so stern and exigent as this shall be it shall send man home to a central solitude shame these social supplicating manners and make him know that much of the time he must have himself to his friend he shall expect no cooperation he shall walk with no companion the nameless thought the nameless power, the superpersonal heart, he shall repose alone in that. He needs only his own verdict. No good fame can help, no bad fame can hurt. The laws are his consolers. The good laws themselves are alive. They know if he have kept them. They animate him with the leading of great duty and an endless horizon. Honor and fortune exist to him who always recognizes the neighborhood of the great. 
always feels himself in the presence of high causes. End of Worship Recording by Daniel Christopher June